Hi, this is Roger Heliobrook and welcome to Ocean Navigator's series on boat wiring. Today we're going to talk about batteries. This is an electrochemical device so we can store energy. And we have a cutaway one here um, that's going to show us uh, the components inside a battery. We have many types of batteries today, but still the most prevalent, the most common, is our flooded battery. It has plates, spongy pure lead on one side, and lead dioxide, lead peroxide, a lead alloy as the other plate. These, as you can see, are in very close proximity and they form the positive and negative side of a battery. Our most common configuration is the 12 volt battery. And as you can see on this battery, we have six groups of cells. Each group of cells, fully charged, is somewhere between 2.1, 2.2 uh, volts per cell. So then when we add those up in series, we end up with 12 volts, a 12 volt battery we call it, but in actual effect it should be somewhere around 12.8 volts fully charged. Next thing we have to consider is that these batteries generally come in two construction methods and that is starting and deep cycle. The difference is the starting battery has many more thinner plates so the chemistry reacts quicker when we demand high starting current and the deep cycles have a more rugged stronger construction because when they're deeply discharged the lead gets weak and we could have shedding plates. On a large cruising boat we could have a dedicated starting battery that would have more plates uh, and its best use is just to start the engine or for emergencies and a specific house bank as long as they're kept isolated. What makes the quality? The grid material, the lead alloy, the lead that goes into it, the strength of the grid and its resistance so that we could get a battery that we only get two or three useful seasons from or we could get a battery that's guaranteed for seven or ten years which you pay obviously a premium price up front. When we're purchasing batteries to uh, re-battery a boat to give us a new power supply we have to be careful that we buy uh, batteries. We can't do part of a bank we have to put batteries together that are of the same age the same type, the same style, and the same size. So one battery cannot overpower another. The battery has sulfuric acid in, and when it's delivered, maybe dry, maybe it's had acid added. But after that, the only thing we add to the battery is distilled water. If we use tap water, we, we add minerals, which can accumulate on the plates and impede the battery's chemical process. All batteries obviously need recharged and we'd love it if we could recharge very quickly and then get to use the battery for as long as possible which minimizes our engine time because the engine alternator is our most common method of recharging. Now these batteries that I mentioned flooded, uh, AGMs, absorbed glass mat, sometimes called sealed valve regulated or recombinant batteries you get it, they recombine, they are, we cannot open the sealed batteries to add distilled water. So their charging regime is very specific. The problem with different battery types is they require a different charging voltage. And as we've had flooded batteries for over a century, uh, they're very tolerant. So that as long as we're about a volt above in our charging, so if the battery's at 12, 8, the alternator's at least got to be at 13, 8, 14 volts. And when it's fully charged, usually our voltmeter will read somewhere around 14.2 volts. This minimizes the amount of current the alternator would drive into the battery. The battery's internal resistance changes as it comes up on full charge, and this resists the amperage 
from the alternator. Remember that we ask for amps. So if the battery is dead and its resistance is low, uh, a lot of current will flow. And this is called its charge acceptance rate. Now flooded batteries can only accept in their beginning even few minutes of charge about 25% of their capacity. And by capacity I mean the amount of amp hours stored in the battery. This is a group 27. It generally has somewhere between 100 and 105 amp hours. Meaning for an hour you could get 105 amps although that's a very dubious proposition, but that's our rating mechanism. Other rating mechanisms are cold cranking amps. How many amps can the battery release at zero Fahrenheit? The newer one, marine cranking amps. How many amps could the battery give us if it was at 32 Fahrenheit? Because hey, who boats at zero Fahrenheit, right? So when we have a battery, its best bang for the buck, the most longevity you'd get out of the battery without really babying it excessively so that we have to have more batteries on board, is to figure out the boat's amp hour consumption over a 24 hour period if you're cruising or over a day's cruising and then say okay that's how many amp hours I need, I need at least triple that. And that's short term cruising. Long term cruising, I would say that you need a battery bank measured in amp hours probably four times your daily amp hour consumption. This is because we could never fully charge the batteries unless we have a generator and a battery charger and are willing to listen to the generator charge it because the amount of time it takes. We can't stuff those amps back into the battery, especially if they're already hot. If we're in the tropics and the battery's already warm in the bilge, it's going to have a harder time accepting that charging current before it overheats internally due to its resistance. So generally when we recharge a battery cruising, we rely upon the alternator. We could back it up with a wind generator. That's a great source because it's consistent over the whole 24 hours. So we give the battery some time to absorb that current and bring it fully up to charge. Solar is also an option. More of as an augmentation unless we have a lot of surface area, but a good way of keeping the battery topped up. Because the engine alternator, like I said, in an hour of engine running, by the time the fridge is down, you've made hot water, uh, you've charged the battery, it may have only come up to around 80%. Consistently doing this uh, leaves the battery short charged and we're not going to get our full amp hours. Hence the equation where we say if we're long distance cruising we need four times our amp hour consumption so that we can reliably get that current from a bank that is only at 80-85% full charge. So that's our basics on battery structure and construction. Next time we'll talk more specifically about maintenance, testing, and the different voltages we have to charge the various lead-acid batteries at, flooded, AGM, and gels.